Uh, good morning, everybody. I am Catherine Chauvel. I'm the president of the European Association of Geochemistry. And today, it's my great pleasure to introduce the 2023 EAG Science Innovation Medal Lecture. This year, this award is named after Nicholas Shackleton to honor his work on climatology. Nicholas Shackleton was a true pioneer, in particular in the use of mass spectrometers to determine changes in the climate. Our 2023 Science Innovation Award medalist is equally a pioneer in a reconstructing Earth's environment of a geological time. So it's a great, great honor to present today this prestigious award to Rose Rickaby. Can you come, Rose? <laughs> So Rose received her medal in the plenary session yesterday, and now I would like to welcome Adina Peitan to tell us more about Rose. Thank you. I'm delighted to um, present Rose with the EGU Science Innovation Award. Um, and it's going, as I said, to Rose Rickaby from Oxford University to add to all the other awards she already has accumulated so far. And um, I want to say that this award is in recognition of scientists that recently came up with some breakthroughs and innovations, but particularly this year in the area of climatology, honoring Nick Shackleton. Uh, other years, this award is given to in the areas of mineralogy and petrology, biogeochemistry, isotope geochemistry, or low temperature geochemistry. And when I was looking at that, I could have said that Rose could have been equally receiving this award any years because her innovations and her really cool science spans a really broad range of disciplines within the geochemistry and beyond. Um, I think from what I can understand or look, she's really driven by curiosity and by the strive to answer and come up with solutions to very, very difficult challenges from her early work on calcium, um, sorry, cadmium calcium ratios in foraminifera for ocean circulation, iodine calcium for looking at proxies for uh, anoxia, through looking at the diverse set of developing proxies in coccolithophores, including their, their adaptation or fit into ocean acidification, and more recently looking specifically on the coevolution of the geosphere and biosphere and including really cool proxies and tools from the biology field incorporating in to geochemistry, and I think this really shows that her span and her broad uh, contribution and work, and she'll tell us more about that. And with that, I'll have Rose come over. Uh, right. Thank you very much, Adina, and uh, wow. Um, imposter syndrome squared. Um, what an incredible honor to receive this medal from the, the EAG. I feel disbelief, humbled, but also elated. Above all, I feel huge gratitude to everyone who has played some part, big or small, wittingly or not, in helping me along the way. Thank you to Catherine Chauvel and Dan Frost of the EAG for somehow thinking me worthy and to Caroline Peacock, Paul Falkowski, Adina Payton, and Jack Middleberg for finding the energy and time to rustle up a nomination. As a rather nerdy, but thankfully sporty teenager, I could never have foreseen my pathway to geology, 
True to say, I was captivated by science, and in particular, the roller coaster story of the thrill of the discovery of the structure of the spiraling double helix of DNA by Crick and Watson and the unsung hero, Rosalind Franklin. Wrapped with characteristic indecision about quite which science to plump for at university, I went to Cambridge to study the all encompassing natural sciences and to drink in the Eagle pub, among others. It was Michael Carpenter who suggested I take geology in the first year, and it blew my mind with its thinking across scales of space and time and imagination. And in the final year, its enviable field trips lured me away from the confines of a final year spent just in the chemistry lab. But the blend of geology and chemistry became the obvious choice for a PhD. I could not have asked for a more brilliant PhD supervisor in the shape of Harry Elderfield. Once I started generating 4-am cadmium calcium data, Harry could not have been more generous with his ideas and thinking, spending many a happy afternoon losing the plot of Kaleidograph in his office as we tackled the glacial Southern Ocean biological pump with cadmium proxies. It was a vibrant time for paleoceanography and carbonates in, chem in Cambridge with truly inspirational characters such as Nick McCabe, Rachel Wood, Tony Dixon and Nick Shackleton sprinkling in their wisdom with a whole host of stars in the making, Carrie Lear, Mark Rudnicki, Paul Wilson, Ian Hall, all willing to chat science over beers at the Eagle pub, among others. Although I peered over the parapet of academia to industry at the end of my PhD, Dan Schrag rescued me with a last minute offer of a postdoc at Harvard. Dan opened my mind to big earth system thinking Whilst I also had the luck to coincide with a sabbatical visit of Edward Bard that allowed me to continue to work on sediment cores while desperately seeking a mechanistic understanding of a biomineral proxy. My move to Oxford was nudged along by Gideon Henderson and I have never managed to leave since. I could not have asked for a more supportive environment, in fact. It's a place that lets interdisciplinarity bubble and I was so fortunate to be able to work with Bob Williams on interactions of metals and life after we initially started chatting about the possible biological role of cadmium together with Francois Morel. Dmitry Filatov most recently has helped me indulge that persistent teenage curiosity about DNA, blending it together with earth sciences. All of these people were so generous with their ideas, but best of all has been the privilege to work with the innumerable, innumerable brilliant masters, PhD students and postdocs whom have, with a little suggestion, gone beyond anything I could imagine. People really are the DNA of scientific advance, transferring knowledge from generation to generation with mutations or ideas spiraling forward into uncharted territory of the scientific ecosystem. I cannot thank my mum enough and my two out of this world boys for letting me dabble with my own genetics and learn what life is really about not forgetting the crucial role of three and four-legged friends, Maxwell and Fuzz. Academia can sometimes feel like a bit of a treadmill, competing for grant money, battling reviewers, tackling administrative tangles. But I think the best bit about this award for me is that it really lets that angst just calm for a moment and opens the way to rediscover the pure thrill of discovering something new that nobody knew before. And that's what it should all be about. Thank you very much. Somehow I've gone halfway through my talk without really. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now on to the sides. Um, well, thanks to the organisers for letting me uh, hijack this session. It was very much about silica this morning, so I'm sorry to direct us back into the, the carbon cycle. Um, and I'm afraid with a name like mine, Ros Rickaby, I'm, I'm a fan of alliteration, and you'll see this pop up in my title. So I'm, I'm going to be talking about peaking at the past controls on the production of pelagic carbonate. And I guess I want to, to, to challenge, as, as others have done in, in the literature, actually, this idea of this traditional idea of carbonate compensation in the ocean, which acts as that intermediary between the weathering input of alkalinity and nutrients to the ocean 
and the output of alkalinity. And we traditionally think of carbonate production being somewhat passive in this, such that the saturation horizon bobs up and down as we raise weathering input, it drops down and allows more burial of alkalinity, always keeping that burial of alkalinity in, in balance with the supply from weathering. But I'm afraid to say, as Adina pointed out, I work on these organisms called coccolithophores, and they are in fact biological organisms and they may not respond to ocean chemistry in the same way as pure inorganic minerals, i.e. they may not respond to saturation state. And as we look in the modern ocean today, we know that in some places it's over four times saturated with respect to calcium carbonate. So it would seem that that, that saturation state cannot be the only thing that is limiting the productivity of calcium carbonate in the ocean. And so it's possible that there are other controls on that production of calcium carbonate, such that we may change the amount of calcium carbonate that's produced from an input of weathering of nutrients or alkalinity. And that then has an impact on how ocean chemistry responds to that input of alkalinity. So if we were to increase the productivity of calcium carbonate, we then bury more of that more shallowly, and we therefore need to lower the carbonate ion of the ocean or the saturation of the ocean in order to dissolve that extra calcium carbonate. And so that alters this gearing of ocean chemistry to alkalinity input. And so I want to try and address kind of what's controlling that production of pelagic calcium carbonate over time scales of the Cenozoic. And I also want you to bear in mind that when coccolithophores form in the ocean, they're not just a package of alkalinity in the form of calcium carbonate, but they're a package of alkalinity coupled together with organic carbon, all in that same package. And that highlights a little bit their challenge physiologically. And I sort of said that coccolithophores are somewhat caught between a rock and a hard place in the sense that they're both a photosynthesizing and a calcifying organism. And if we put that in the context of carbonate chemistry of the ocean, then if we were to dissolve CO2 in, the, in the, the ocean, you can see at the acidic end of this uh, 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 pH range, the CO2 exists mostly as CO2 aqueous. And that's wonderful for photosynthesis. That's the, that's the substrate that these organisms require for rubisco. But then I've told you that they're also calcifying. And so in that sense, they'd like to live at the basic end of this uh, uh, pH spectrum in the sense that that's where we've got carbonate ions and it's arguably more easy to calcify. So the coccoliths are really caught with a sort of quandary in terms of what, what sort of pH do I live at and how does that help me control how much calcium carbonate I generate. So in order to try and address this question of what controls the production rates of calcium carbonate in the ocean in the past, we ideally need a proxy. We've heard this is, this is where I've sort of come from in the past. And it's now a while ago where I started to get interested in the stable isotope vital effects of coccolithophores. And I became interested in them because although it was a time of learning about ocean acidification, what we also saw is that the isotopic offset from equilibrium seemed to be also sensitive to the carbonate chemistry in which the coccolithophores were growing. So what I'm showing you in the top two panels is the delta C13 and the delta O18 of coccolith calcite in two different species of coccolithophore, the Geoceanica is in the black spots and the open circles are the Coccolithus braurudii. Now these two coccolithophores are quite contrasting. Geoceanica is small, it's quite lightly calcified and it grows very quickly. Coccolithus braurudii is a large, heavily calcifying coccolithophore that tends to grow rather slowly. And we see they have contrasting impacts of the carbon dioxide availability on their isotopic disequilibrium where the large, slow-growing coccolithophores at low CO2 availability show this offset to isotopically light values in both the carbon and the oxygen uh, isotopes that they record in their calcite lists. At the time, I, su I suggested that this was perhaps limited, uh, controlled in some way by CO2 limitation. And indeed, it was Harry McClelland who then joined the group a few years later ran some more culture experiments and found this same sort of splaying of these vital effects between the small lightly calcified species and the large he heavily calcified species with low CO2. And he was able to generate a quantitative model that showed that this deviation from equilibrium depended on the degree to which you were calcifying. So the lightly calcifiers had strong photosynthesis, 
removing the light carbon and making that calcite isotopically heavy. Meanwhile, the larger calcifiers tended towards the, the bicarbonate supply. All these experiments were run at constant pH, so going back to that sort of pH uh, 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 scale, all at the same pH, but with differing amounts of DIC, so things like CO2 and carbonate ion were going up at the same rate. And it's taken Nick uh, Chowhan now, a, a PhD student in, in my group, to, to try the exact orthogonal experiment. And I have to say, I was slightly, well, how do we know the, the results of this? But he said, no, 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 let's, let's, let's do this and look at the isotopes. And it turned out that was really true. So he has grown a range of species, again, a gradient of small, lightly calcifying, fast growing species and large, heavily calcifying <laughs> species in these, this range of pH going from 7.6 up to 8.8. .8. And I'm just showing you here the specific growth rates in response to that pH change. And you can see the large heavily calcifying, or, well, first of all, I should say all growth rates of these organisms are limited by low pH. So you can see the growth rates on the, on the right -hand, left hand side of that graph all trending down to, to low values at low pH. You then see something of a growth optima for each of these different species where the growth optima progresses to higher pH as you go to those small lightly calcifying species compared to the large heavily calcifying species. And there's about a two and a half fold change in that growth rate of those coccolithophores. So what's clear is that a fundamental component of how coccolithophores respond is that as they get smaller, they grow faster and they calcify less. And this seems to be a fundamental trade-off in the physiology of coccolithophores. And what's also key is that as we come to those very high pHs, the heavily calcified species, they, they sort of fall off their optima. The small guys are racing ahead at 8.8, a pH of 8.8. .8. What's rather interesting is that actually they're slightly limited by the lower pH. Our ocean today is about 8.2. And they're slightly pH limited and actually are, 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 they, they would grow better at a higher pH. But the heavily calcified species, they have a high carbon demand within their cells. And they seem to show this CO2 limitation as we go up to the higher pH. I showed you that CO2 aqueous starts to come down in that, that speciation diagram. And they're really being challenged for their access to CO2. So this seems to be how these species respond to this pH gradient and CO2 gradient. What about the isotopes? Well, we see rather similar things to what we saw with CO2, the CO2 only change that I showed in, uh, uh, back in 2010, in fact, but there are also differences. So the similarities are this splaying of the effects between the heavy uh, calcified and the light calcified organisms as we go to low CO2, which is high pH in these experiments. Um, but as we come up to the high CO2, which is low pH, you see all of the, the values sort of dropping off and dropping off to really quite low isotopic values. And so there, there, there's clearly some nuance by this sort of orthogonal carbonate chemistry um, experiment. And this is evidenced more when we look at plotting the carbon versus the oxygen isotopes. There are similarities, but some differences. So perhaps the, the similarity that I want to point out is that we get very distinctive gradients in the carbon and oxygen isotopic values of, of the calcite in both these experiments, which seem to be preserved between them. And they're distinctive for the small, lightly calcified species having a much steeper carbon and oxygen isotope gradient compared to the he heavily calcified species, which seem to have a much shallower carbon to oxygen isotope uh, uh, range. Having said that, there are clear differences in kind of the response to actually CO2. So in the old experiments, which are in the upper curve, the red curves here, you can certainly see in the Jafira capsule oceanica, I get a, this really tiny cluster of, of, of data points and the high CO2 end is towards the right end. But if I look at my more recent experiments, I'm getting the, as I go up that gradient, I'm getting the low CO2 uh, uh, grown uh, uh, values at, at this end of the gradient. So it's clear that CO2 limitation cannot be the only thing that is driving this change. But there is nonetheless conserved between these experiments run many years in between and with very different um, uh, conditions that those gradients are preserved. 
And the thing that unifies uh, those isotopic values appears to be the growth rate. I, in those, those former experiments I ran in 2010, the growth rates didn't change very much in those Jafira capsa oceanica experiments. But in Nick's experiment, we got those big pH optima changing the growth rates. And that's the thing that seems to be inherently driving this isotopic offset from equilibrium of the delta C13 uh, with growth rate, and that's true across all of these different species. But the curious thing is that this is sort of counterintuitive. In a way, I would expect high growth rates, therefore the biggest, let's say, kinetic impact. The fact that the carbon and the oxygen isotopes are correlating is starting to hint to me that this is something to do with the kinetics of, of the process. But here I get where, where they're growing really fast, the expression of kinetics in the calcite is minimal. And if anything, when they're growing really fast, the isotopes are looking most like the delta C13 of the, of the bicarbonate and the delta O18 of the bicarbonate in the solution. And as I go to lower growth rates, I'm getting these much greater imprints of, of lighter isotopes. So this is really quite counterintuitive. And the best explanation that I can have for this is, is we've been, been starting to do some circadian clock experiments in our, in, our, in our lab. I have a fantastic student, Zhao Ju Ma, who seems to need no sleep at all and is able to sort of uh, 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 work ridiculous hours on for very short periods of time, I should say. This is not something I encourage. She kind of said, I'm going to do this. Um, and we're sort of slowly discovering when calcification takes place during this circadian clock. So something that grows at a rate of, or divides at a rate of one per day means that you divide into two at a 24 hour period. And as the cells divide, they take with them some of the, the cells for the, the calcite from the parent. They, they're partially calcified at that point and they divide at night. And then during the day, they slowly enlarge and they fill up that coccosphere of the calcium carbonate. So if you change from a growth rate of 0.2, that means I divide every five days, to a growth rate of one, it means I divide every day, then a slow growth rate means that your interior carbon pool is kind of sitting there for five days versus one day. And so to me, it seems that the slower the growth rate, the greater the time for the accumulation of this cross-membrane diffusion of uh, isotopically light, both O816 and C12, into the internal pool before you calcify and divide. And the, slow, the, the alternative is the slower the growth rate, the greater the activity, the sort of pumping, let's say, on the impact of that internal pool for calcification, arguably pumping calcium into that internal pool, which aggravates the CO2 diffusion gradient and accelerates it, giving you a greater kinetic imprint. So what I think is happening is the carbon isotopic value is being controlled by this diffusion gradient and the amount of CO2 that is diffusing into that internal pool during calcification. So I'm sorry, this is sort of not a very nice graph to look at, but it's essentially trying to show you the kinetics of the oxygen to carbon isotopes in that coccolith calcite um, uh, with growth rate, essentially. And so you can see these, these variations where you've got a far steeper slope in the smaller, lightly calcifying cells um, relative to the larger, heavily calcifying cells. But that gradient, so, so where you're sitting on the carbon isotopic gradient, um, is really being dictated by the amount of carbon that is diffusing into your internal pool whilst you're growing slowly. And then this gradient seems to be very size dependent. So as you get bigger, you've got a much shallower gradient. And that must result from either a size dependent residence time where the rate limiting step is the re-equilibration of the oxygen isotopes. Um, because essentially for oxygen isotopes, you have to exchange three oxygens for full isotopic equilibrium. You've got three ox uh, 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 two oxygens in the carbon and three in the bicarbonate. The alternative is that the larger you are, the more carbonic anhydrase you have, which has the impact of accelerating that hydration. So this gradient is very much telling you about the effective residence time of the carbon in that interior pool before it becomes uh, uh, calcified. So we seem to have some kind of mechanistic understanding then of these, these vital effects being related to the growth rate and the size of the coccolis. And as I've told you, those things are intimately linked to size, growth rate, and calcification. 
the nice thing is that these gradients seem to be preserved even into geological samples. And so this sort of tells us that we're seeing something in culture that is truly there in the past geological record. So this is some data that was generated by Louis Claxton, a former PhD student of mine, from the Eocene period, so about 50 million years ago, and, and looking at a period through that Eocene. And in the red, I'm showing you the, the carbon to oxygen isotopic gradient of the lists in the three to five micron size separated fraction from these sediments. And in the orange, you can see the 15 to 20 micron fraction. And just for, for to reference, the 15 to 20 micron fraction doesn't contain coccoliths today. These are enormous coccoliths of the Eocene that existed, but you can really see the shallowing of that gradient in the, in the carbon and oxygen isotope. So we're seeing something very fundamental of the physiology of these different coccolithophores. So can we then go through, let's say, the Cenozoic and try and see what's happened to the expression of these vital effects or this disequilibrium through time? And so here's Louis that, that looked through the Eocene and he was able to identify the emergence of vital effects. I'm sorry, I'm going back to my alliteration, but the emergence of vital effects in the enormous coccolithophores of the Eocene. So as we go from 54 million years ago up to 38 or so, you can see all of the carbon isotopes of, of the different size fractions are uh, jammed together during the early Eocene climatic optimum. And they then diverge as you come through towards about 48 million years ago only in the 15 to 20 micron fraction. And that goes alongside a, a, a reconstruction of Alan Yostu here, who looked at the surface pH through this same time, and we see this drop of, of oh, sorry, rise of pH at the same time associated with the drop of CO2 aqueous. And so it would seem that that's a period of time when these large 15 to 20 micron fraction uh, uh, species are becoming limited either by rising pH or by declining CO2 in the environment. If we step forwards in time going through the Cenozoic, this is now zeroing in on the zero to 20 million years ago. Um, and, and on the right hand side, I'm showing you a really nice piece of work from Bolton and Stoll that showed about 10 million years ago now. So we sort of zoomed forward about 40 million years. But 10 million years ago, we get the emergence of this light uh, carbon isotopic value in the, now in the eight to 10 micron fraction. So this is, we've gone from big guys to these medium sized eight to 10 micron coccolithophores expressing this light isotopic value, slowing growth rate in response to potentially carbonate chemistry about 10 million years ago. And this is also seen, this was a, a cheeky way to use some of Nick Shackleton's data where he had some bulk data from site 844. And if we just plot that bulk data from site 844 relative to the forearms, we indeed see the same trend towards light isotopic values in the bulk sediments being dominated by these eight to 10 micron fractions. The final step where we can see a change in the, the, these vital effects is in these piddly ones of the pleistocene. So if you look at about two and a half million years ago on the right hand slide, this is some coccolith data that I've, I've been sitting on for a while where we start to see that emergence of the positive delta C13 value. So we're generating these small very rapidly growing coccolithophores just in the last two and a half million years. So this is really changing the carbonate factory of, of, of the open ocean. We've really gone from a time as we've sort of increased pH towards the modern day and decreased aqueous CO2, we've gone from, as you might expect, if something is being rather more diffusion or carbon limited, we've gone from limiting these really large 15 micron uh, coccolithophores to the eight to 10, and to the three to five and the less than three absolutely dominating in this more modern ocean. And it's really nice to sort of see that essentially on the geological record, we're doing exactly the same as we've done in, in Nick's experiments of, of evolving from the, 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 the larger to the smaller and much faster um, growing coccolithophore. So again, uh, coming back to my alliteration, it looks like pH, PCO2 are likely past controls on pelagic carbonate um, productivity. But what I've shown you there is the limitation and selection for a changing size in the coccolithophores. What does that actually mean for production rates? And this is where Aloisi has shown us some really nice stoichiometric uh, relationships in amongst the coccolithophores, um, uh, looking at optimum culture experiments. And really what, what he's shown is that a reduction in cell size from about 17, so an average of 15 to 20, down to about 3 microns, 
you would raise the growth rate by about twofold. And again, that's the sort of magnitude of change we are seeing in, in Nick's experiments. I should point out that this also lowers the phosphate demand of these cells. We know these tiny cells are really effective at getting phosphate from the ocean and indeed organophosphates. The impact of this is though this decline in size though is that you per cell you decrease the calcification by about 200 fold. So you're raising the growth rate but it's certainly not compensated for by the, 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 the um, calcite per cell. But what we do know is a little bit about the numbers of those cells that we find in the ocean. And the small coccolithophores hugely outnumber the large coccolithophores, at least in the modern ocean. And so the, this, this ratio, it's, it's fairly easy to get 200 times more Emiliani Huxleyi than a coccolithus pelagicus. And so that probably means that the calcification production rates in the overall coccolith ecosystem probably stay about the same or arguably increase um, uh, over this period of time. And just looking at this, actually, there's some estimates of carbonate mass accumulation rate, looking at this in the deep sea floor. And we see these pulses of carbonate mass accumulation rate in the top left there, between about 55 and 35 million years or so, and between about 20 and zero uh, million years. And that corresponds to the Eocene sort of warmth, let's say, where it looks like our thermostat is working. We've got a lot of pulse of alkalinity into the ocean and we get high carbonate mass accumulation rate, where as that pH starts to increase, we start to growth rate limit those large coccolithophores. And the same thing happens in this second pulse from the Miocene climatic optimum. Again, it looks like the thermostat is working, silicate weathering is going up, providing more ingredients for the coccolithophores. But as we go over the hump of that weathering, then we start to get those vital effects emerging. There's an interesting uh, component here in terms of what happens to that carbonate. So we, if we think that production rates are about similar, that the, 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 the numbers of the small coccolithophores are arguably compensating for those large coccolithophores, if it's similar, then we know that we've got also a dropping CCD. Our CCD has got deeper over this Cenozoic timescale. So what that means is in that second pulse, of carbonate production and accumulation, we're actually um, increasing the dissolution rate of that carbonate because we've got a deeper CCD and yet we're seeing similar carbonate mass accumulation rates. There has to be a higher dissolution rate of that calcium carbonate. And so this is the interesting part about that packaging of calcium carbonate with organic carbon, is it implies that as that coccolithophore size decreases, you have a, a, a lower pick to pop, lower particulate in organic to put particulate organic carbon. But that means you've got an in-house dissolution mechanism as that organic matter decays, it's generating acids which dissolves that calcium carbonate. And that's what we term respiration dissolution. And so it's possible that as we've gone to those smaller coccolithophores, greater productivity of them involves more dissolution of that calcium carbonate, essentially keeping the alkalinity in the seawater. And this is something that was proposed by C. et al. for the Miocene period, where we've got huge production of calcium carbonate, but also increased dissolution at that time. So this is a sort of mental, just a uh, little schematic to go back to that, that, that if we have the same productivity of calcium carbonate, but we've got lower pick to pock of that calcium carbonate, the increased respiration dissolution that's marked by my sort of three alkalinity arrow here means that I don't need to dissolve so much by the saturation horizon in the ocean. And so more of that alkalinity is, is essentially sitting in the ocean. I get a higher carbonate ion overall in my ocean and therefore a lower PCO2. And so it's possible that this selection, the smaller, faster growing coccolithophores has changed the dissolution profile of the ocean over the Cenozoic and left more alkalinity in the ocean to essentially absorb CO2. We can have a little test. I've got two minutes just to, to try and get to a final sort of case study test. Um, but this is now zoning in on the last one million years, the Pleistocene, one of Nick Shackleton's playgrounds, and I sort of had to get there for, for Nick. Um, and this was a period of time where there was an absolute revelation in the coccolithophores. There was this huge acme of this particular species called Jephyrocapsa caribianica. 
If you go anywhere in the Atlantic or in the Indian Ocean, you find this, this sort of nanofossil ooze that is dominating the oceans. And it dominates the oceans on about a 400,000 year time scale. So on the left hand side, you can see the, the counts of Ehups more recently, and then Jephyrocaps of Caribbeanica in the sort of third graph down. And the numbers of these coccolithophores are enormous to the point that Luke Beaufort took about two years to send me the data because he didn't believe the numbers. Um, and associated with that enormous bloom of coccolithophores that is a global event, I'm just showing you one core here, but there are multiple cores that show this same change. We have, of course, associated with that increased carbonate mass accumulation rates. That's on the top graph on the left hand side here. Um, but associated with that also, and is on the second graph down, is the dissolution profile. So we have masses of accumulation rates of calcium carbonate, but we also have much greater intensity of dissolution. And this is even seen in cores at about a kilometer depth in the North Atlantic. So that really tells us this respiration dissolution is kicking in in those very shallow uh, realms. And this really seems to be how the coccolithophore acme is potentially driving that ocean chemistry. And just on the right hand side, the vital effects come into play again, because during this 400 kilo year peak in the coccolith fraction, we get some of the most positive delta C13 values that we've seen in these, these coccolith fractions. And so these are really fast growing coccolithophores blooming at this time of the mid Brynjus acne. So we've got evidence of, the, of them driving this respiration dissolution, but what does it matter for sort of climate and, and just to get back to sort of one of the quandaries of Nick Shackleton about the 100,000 year cycle. And again, if we look at this bloom of the coccolithophores, it seems to coincide or it occurs just before we get the step up in the glacial interglacial CO2 amplitude. So we have in that kind of mid Pleistocene time, we've got much smaller amplitude glacial interglacial fluctuations of CO2. After that, we go to much bigger ones, 90 ppmv or so. And so it's possible that this increased carbonate burial from the mid Brynjus actually drives a, a sink of alkalinity from the ocean and it reduces what's left in the ocean. So you've got less buffer capacity of the ocean. And so it actually allows those small perturbations to become much bigger in atmospheric CO2. And this was something that was modeled by C et al, that when you have two times carbonate production, as he was looking at in the Miocene, you're essentially removing that alkalinity and leaving the ocean carbonate chemistry to be perturbed by much greater uh, degree. And so this is a little argument to, to suggest that perhaps this is contributing to changing the amplitude of CO2 in those, those later um, uh, glacial cycles. So I was remiss in not having this at the beginning, I debated should I have it at the beginning, should I have it at the, at the end, but Nick Shackleton was really a, a, a hero of, of, of mine. I was lucky to interact with him um, whilst I was uh, in Cambridge. He was uh, always brilliant to talk to in, in terms of science. And he was, I guess, just so enthusiastic about just purely looking at sediments. And I think I, I shouldn't say that at a geochemistry conference, but actually just, <laughs> Just, just sort of looking at the fossils that you have as you go down the microscope and down the sediments can, can give you half the information that you will then find out with your fancy geochemical tools. But he was a, he was a, a real pioneer. He established this high precision isotopic analysis of oxygen and carbon in, in carbon dioxide. He was already looking at things like these vital effects, at least in planktonic forams. He worked on the Brunhus epoch, and he was curious about this 100,000 year cycle amongst an enormous array of other things. And it's sort of just incredible to me how much thinking he was doing before I was even born. And before you do your calculations, I shall move on to the conclusions. <laughs> um, so, uh, the, the, I, and I guess what I want to show you is that vital effects are normally being seen as an annoyance, but I really think that there is information in those biological fractionations. And so the, the, the key for me has been to try and find a proxy with some kind of physiological understanding. <coughs> I've tried to sit in this, this session and, and show you how I think that this biogenic production of carbonate and its changing nature over time has perhaps contributed to uh, uh, changing ocean chemistry because we've had this selection for faster growing, less nutrient demanding, lower pick to pot coccolithophores. We've therefore potentially changed the calcite production efficiency, but I think the really interesting bit is how 
the coupling of that alkalinity and organic carbon has potentially changed potentially the organic carbon burial rate as well as the impact of changing the dissolution profile in the in the ocean leading to alkalinity rise um, and so i just eternally grateful to everybody and i know i would forget anybody crucial i've named most of these people in my in my talk at the beginning and, and just to sort of show you this is our our little ocean bug group in in oxford and we're always looking for bright young minds to, to come along and we have nice weekly meetings and this one was with donuts so there we go thank you very much for your attention <laughs> Thank you very much. And actually, I do think your talk was a great fit for the session. So we were glad to have you. Um, I think we do have maybe a minute or two for questions. And then uh, we're also going to be having a social event this evening where we can continue some of these conversations. Um, when and where? Here. To be confirmed later, the uh, afternoon yeah. session. OK, <laughs> yeah, we'll confirm in the afternoon session. I think it's at Suelte, which is one of the restaurants on the strip there. Water. Is this on? No. Okay. Hi. Thank you. That was a great talk. I feel like I relearned everything I've learned since I was a grad student in your talk. So thank you so much about carbonate uh, calcification. I also think about the organic side. So you were talking about, we also see this uh, fractionation with growth rate in the organics as well. Have you thought about that at all? I know this is kind of out of what you were talking about, but no, it, it's an absolutely great question, and, and I, I just didn't have time to put it in into um, the, the, the talk that I have here, but what's really interesting is that that gradient in the carbon to oxygen isotope ratio um, has, it, it, it's not matched by the gradient in C13 in the calcium carbonate to C13 in the organics, um, but it's not matched by it, but you can sort of arguably understand it in the same way. So in the in the guys that are growing really fast, they have a negligible gradient between their C13 of the calcite and the organic carbon. So they've got change in the organic carbon. No, hang on, sorry, no change in the organic carbon, but a lot of change in the calcium carbonate. And I interpret that as the fact that the, the supply rate is essentially meeting the demand rate of the cell, such that you don't see any Rayleigh fractionation within the interior of the cell. In, there are guys there where there was no gradient in the carbon to oxygen isotope ratio, but they had a really strong correlation between their calcium carbonate and their organic carbon. And so there it seems that the demand is high but and the, the, the residence time in the, in the system, in the interior pool is long enough uh, that you eliminate the oxygen isotope vital effect, but the, the, the uh, organic matter is essentially seeing that see, the, the, the isotopically light carbon coming into the cell, if you see what I mean, and so you get this really nice correlation. So I, I think that they are combined in the coccolithophores actually, and I, I think it, it's all about the residence time and the diffusion rate of carbon into the cell. So they are linked in these different species, but in slightly different ways is the short answer. But I think, I think there is something really interesting about what all of this means for organic carbon, because I think the fact that you start to bury some of your calcium carbonate with an isotopically heavy carbon isotope value actually gives you more wriggle room to bury some more organic carbon isotopically light and so i think in terms of thking about carbon isotope budgets through the cenozoic it allows us a bit more wriggle room to bury more organic carbon great thank you <laughs> any other questions uh, if no, I have one actually. For, um, first of all, congratulations on the Shackleton Medal. Uh, but there's a question. I'm curious if you tested some other proxies that are sensitive to growth rate effects, such as calcium isotopes or strontium calcium uh, ratios, to validate the growth rate hypothesis. Because I would expect, for example, to have a strong anti correlation between carbon and calcium isotopes. Calcium are heavier, of course, to fluids when the growth rate is lower, and lighter when it's faster. I'm sorry if I missed some of the publication. Maybe you've already done that, so I'm just curious. No, no, no. It's 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 a great, great question, and it's I I, I sort of focus this on stable isotopes. Um, 
but I, there was a, there was a sneaky little bit of strontium calcium in there, and there was uh, Heather Stoll was a, a leader in suggesting the strontium calcium in coccolithophores as a proxy for for growth rate, and uh, I did a little bit of work on that in in cultures also early on, and I think um, it's certainly I, th I think we have a a, a more clear vision of, of that, that strontium calcium is indeed correlating with growth rate. That was the evidence that we had from those cultures. And now that I have this sort of better insight from the C13, it was kind of interesting to go back to this old core. And actually, I don't think we've ever really truly understood this. Um, I haven't managed, I should have got the arrow going. But anyway, in, in this, uh, this lower graph here is strontium calcium of the coccolith fraction. And so what we see, and there's this beautiful correlation actually between the strontium calcium in the coccolith fraction and the C13 in the coccolith fraction, where you get the most positive C13 when you get the highest strontium calcium. So I think it is potentially uh, related to growth rate, but my guess is it's not because of why we, it's not, the mechanism is not how we think it is. And I think it relates to the size of this internal pool, which I think is very much linked to the size of the growth rate and some beautiful work by Gerald Langer suggested that um, when you are growing your calcium carbonate because it discriminates against the strontium you end up with a high strontium calcium left in the pool and what I think is that when you're growing really quickly you're essentially using up that pool really fast so you end up with a high strontium calcium and when you're growing much slower you end up with a much lower strontium calcium but it was really interesting to see this sort of really nice correlation between the two growth rate proxies. I haven't done so much work on calcium isotopes, I apologize. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. yeah. Great, great talk, Ross. Uh, I wondered if you thought about corals, because, uh, you know, the mechanism you're proposing seems to be opposite to what they, they suggest, uh, causing the more positive uh, carbon isotopes, you know, i.e. they they associate with slower growing and high pH, uh, sorry, low pH, and the other way around, you know, and like in a deep sea coral, if you go back to the work of people like Jess Atkins and other people where they sort of micro drilled out and they find that the faster growing bits of the skeleton have the most more negative carbon and oxygen. And if you do that model from uh, you know the ZB type models and you plot carbon against oxygen, you get a slope which looks identical to your coccolis and also to the corals. Yeah, it's in fact I was I was in preparation for this talk. My head was in Jess Adkins' work, and it was I, it's Sang Chen. I, I don't know if he's here, but anyway, I was I was reading um, distinctly his uh, his papers where he's tried to model the deep sea corals where you get the kink as you go out to the calcification center. Um, I guess the bit that I don't know is how well you know the growth rate of the coral, and I think that the the the, chat, the, the nice thing almost about the coccolithophores is that I think everything that they have within the calcite has to come across a membrane, in terms of being transported either by diffusion or by some kind of channel. Um, and I think the difference for the corals is that they have this sort of mix of seawater, I believe. Or maybe not actually now i'm trying to think about it but they, they, they have a very different geometry and um so the answer is i i don't i i don't know how to apply this to the corals i was thinking about it with regard to forams because the interesting thing with the forams is that you get a real size dependence to the carbon isotopic uh effect and you tend to see the lightest isotopic values at the smallest forams where they go much more towards bicarbonate at the larger um, values. So I have dodged your question because I don't know the answer yeah, so and I need to think about it a bit more. Uh, how uh, Spiro did these experiments where he grew them at different pH, yeah. didn't understand it. And then uh, Richard came along and he, he explained it all by the mechanism I just explained in four amps. So yeah. Yes, yes, no. And I, th I think, well, certainly four amps have got that glug of seawater that they start with. Um, and I, I guess I haven't, I haven't unified this across organisms. I was trying to put it into the context of what I knew about with the coccolithophores and, and, and link it back to the Cenozoic, I guess. Uh, could, could, could the smaller 
Uh, I'm, try I'm trying to. I'm trying to. I guess it's too stressful. I can't. Also, think can of you it. maybe uh, repeat the yeah. question in microphone so people online could hear? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Oh, was okay. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, the smaller coccolithophores, they are growing faster, which means the photosynthesis is uh, higher, so the pH is uh, higher as well, and then the equilibration time is uh, taking a longer time. While the bigger one, they have a slower photosynthesis or less photosynthesis, which is increasing the pH less, and then the equilibration time is slower, uh, is faster. Sorry. I think. Well, I think the 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 challenge is what the the impact on the pHs of the cell, in the sense that the the photosynthesis will certainly raise the pH of the environment, but then the calcification acts in the other direction so there's sort of the, the as you calcify you're lowering the ph outside the cell whereas as you photosynthesize you're raising the ph outside the cell so i guess the general impact would be that because you've got a larger cell with a higher pick to pock that is going to have the impact of lowering the ph whereas the smaller cells have got a lower pick to pock which means they're going to raise the ph in the environment but they are calcifying less, the smaller ones they are calcifying less, right? Yes, hang on, so, have I got that the wrong way around? I can't think on the high yeah, bright they are, lights. They are <laughs> going to acidify less. So, well. No, but they, they, they photosynthesize more relative to calcification, so they will raise the pH. Is yeah. that what I said? Yeah. Okay, so that's what you said. Yeah, it's possible. <laughs> It's possible. I have to say, all, all I can say is that the unifying thing between the experiments that I ran years ago and this one is, seems that growth rate is the key bit and something to do with that growth rate drives that gradient. Um, oh, sorry, something to do with the growth rate and the size, I should say, drives that gradient and drives where you are on that gradient. Now, what, what, what controls that gradient part, I still don't mechanistically truly know but I can link it to the physiology of the cell, I guess. And, and because they're, everything is correlated, I guess that's what I feel more confident about now in the coccolithophores that, you know, if you are big, you're gonna grow slower and you're gonna calcify more. There is this kind of intimate link between those things physiologically, and it seems to play out in that gradient. But I, you're right, it, I should think more carefully about what is, it is that drives that gradient. Yeah, and, and actually it means also that uh there is not enough carbonic anhydrase in the smaller one to re-equilibrate. Yes, yes, if, like, yes. So there is kind of a like, limitation. I think that's, I think that's of, right. The, the only amount of carbonic anhydrase. But, yeah. but the only thing I would say about that is it comes back to the earlier discussion about the organic carbon, which I didn't show in this, in this talk, where you get um, no change in the organic carbon fractionation in the small fast growing ones and so it really looks as though the dynamic is related to the fact that at least to explain that that implies your you've almost got no Rayleigh fractionation within that interior pool if you see what I mean so the supply is is meeting the demand yeah okay thank you we can we can talk a bit Thanks. more about let's wrap up and thank yeah, Roz sorry. and all the other speakers <laughs> And we'll resume back in this room at 2.30.